darkness, two nerds set out on the quest to knowledge. Many goblins, hags, and even dragons stand between them and the answers they seek. Join Jeremiah and Rob as they crawl through caverns and challenge their own intellect, armed with only thoughts, wits, and rule books. These nerds will scour the lands for theories and insights never thought before. Will they rise to the challenge, or will they critically fail their lifelong quest? Welcome to Theoretical Insights of d and Hi, I'm Jeremiah. What are we talking about today? Rob, we're talking about the Artificer. What are you doing? Artificing? Oh, okay. Well, get it over here. We're recording. Oh, okay. Had to do the rev it up thing. You ready to record? Are you still working on that? little catapult you're building over there i'll finish it later okay is that a catapult or a trebuchet it's actually a uh ballista oh okay yeah it's a little i may have done some measuring wrong i wanted to be 35 inches tall and didn't take into account the depths of the the metal beneath it so rob you you realize what you're like you're trying to build from is a catfish trophy you hang on the wall right yeah it's fine Okay, cool. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. That's what I'm going to launch. He's going to look surprised the whole time. Okay, so it's a it's a ballista that launches fish that you hang on the wall. Yeah. Okay. What's it called? What's this ballista going to be called? Bafista. Bafista? Yeah. You know, he's my favorite wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Bafista. Yeah. Oh. Um, but yeah, we're covering the Artificer today. And you may be... You know, well versed in the spellcasters of a fantasy land or knights and warriors of nobility, but you ain't ready for this magical tinker of a mechanical sort. So, the Artificer is one of the classes that has been released like three different times for 5e. Probably. There was an Unearthed Arcana one, then there was one that was released in like one of the Eberron books or something. And then there was another one that was released, and Wizards of the Coast was like, all right, this is the artifact. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, XB to level three, the YouTuber, mm-hmm. he actually made his own homebrew artificer class because the, he, after they made released the first one in the Unearth, because he wasn't really happy with it. Yeah. And then, like, after he made that episode, like, I think, like, a week or two weeks later, Wizards of the Coast was like, all right, here's the new artificer. He's like, dang it. Fair. <laughs> but yeah, so this, the artificer is honestly probably one of the strongest uh, themed uh, characters you can play. Oh, yeah, guaranteed. There's there's always that set theme of the magical tinkerer making magic items or uh, messing around with a clockwork or clock gear uh, construct of some sort. And there are certain things that the subclasses get that are that can be game-breaking if you're oh, not yeah. careful. Yeah. Like, the, there's an artificer in my game... And when he told me what he wanted to play and started laying out exactly everything he would be able to do at a higher level, I was just like, okay, um, let's do something to where maybe it'll be a little bit harder for you to do those things. Not impossible, but let's turn it into like a monster hunter deal to where you have to go and get all the resources you need to make it instead of just saying, okay, I spent eight hours. Now I have this magical suit of armor. Like, Go get the components. Go, yeah. go get a gem that'll power it. Stuff like that. Yeah. So, let's hop right into the mechanics of the Artificer. So, the hit dice is a D8. Same as the Cleric. It's a pretty good one. Proficiencies is light, medium armors, and uh, shields. Only proficient with simple weapons, though. Makes sense. Checks out. It does. But, you your tools that you can choose from are Thieves Tools, Tinker Tools, and one type of uh, or one type of artisan's tools of your choice. No, and one type. And one type. Yeah, okay. so you get thieves, tinkers, and an additional tool choice. But the in- the interesting thing is, is the saving throws are constitution and intelligence. You don't see that in anywhere else. Nope, that's it's, the only one. It's similar to sorcerer because they have constitution and charisma. And it kind of goes hand in hand with the skills that you get to choose from. You choose two from arcana, history, investigation, medicine, nature, perception, and sleight of hand. But... 
there's a little bit of an additive down here where it says the secrets of gunpowder weapons have been discovered in various corners of the multiverse. So, if your DM uses the rules on firearms and your artificer has been exposed to the operation of such weapons, you automatically gain proficiency in firearms. Nice. That's the only class that gets that. That's true. I think the uh, gun gunslinger fighter subclass that we never covered also yeah. gets them. Well, yeah, but it's just, you know. That makes sense. That that wasn't a, uh, that's a subclass. This is the artificer yeah. itself. Yeah. Well, I just want to bring up the class that we have, the subclass we haven't covered. It's fine. People already know. Yeah. But your starting equipment, you can choose two simple weapons of your choice, a light crossbow and 20 bolts, your choice of studded leather or scale mail, and thieves tools and a dungeoneer's pack. Pretty good. So, yeah, it's actually a pretty good start off. But what they get with their, just their base class, there is so it's much. Enough. It's so much. Oh, yeah. I mean, first level, magical tinkering. So you learn how to invest a spark of magic into mundane objects. You use this ability. To use it, you have to have thieves tools or artisan tools in hand, and then you touch a tiny non-magical object as an action and give it one of the following magical properties of your choice. It sheds bright light in a five-foot radius and dim light for another five feet. Uh, whenever tapped by a creature, the object emits a recorded message that can be heard up to 10 feet away. Uh, it's got to be no longer than six seconds. It continually, continuously emits your choice of an odor or nonverbal sound. The chosen phenomenon can, is perceivable up to 10 feet away. And a static visual effect appears on one of the object's surfaces. This effect may, can be a picture up to 25 words of text, lines and shapes, or a mixture of all these ele elements as you like. It's pretty good. You could create a slideshow. Yeah, you could. You could also make like a little stink bomb. But here's the thing. It lasts indefinitely. Yeah. And you could use an action to end it early if you wanted to. That's true. However, you do have a maximum amount of these objects that you can have. Uh, and it's equal to your intelligence modifier. Minimum of one. Yeah, it'd be all right. You also get spell casting at first level, so the Artificer is, in fact, a full caster. Now, their spell casting is a little bit different than what we've seen before. Well, they are a full caster and yet half caster because they only go up to a fifth level spell. Yeah, it's it's strange. It's yeah. like a three-quarters caster. But they're getting so much in between that if they, get, if they had given them access to ninth level spell slots... It would have been over. Oh, yeah. So, where a wizard has an arcane focus and the cleric has a holy symbol, the artificer uh, has to be holding artesian tools or thieves tools in his hand to cast a spell. And for wording reason, every spell that they cast has a material component, and that is these tools in hand. Uh, let me run down some tools that may not be exactly, or let's see what your personal ruling is on this. Would you allow an artificer, the new game show of this of this episode? Yeah. Would you allow an artificer? Rob. No. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, as a DM, for the sake of spellcasting and the material component of the tools being needed in hand to cast an artificer spell, would you allow an artificer to cast a spell using leatherworker's tools? Yeah. What about Smith's tools? Definitely. Jeweler's tools. I think it'd be interesting. Carpenter's tools. Yeah. Mason's tools? Of course. Glass blower's tools. That's weird. All right. Wood carver tools. Yeah. Navigator tools. That's an interesting one. Like, I mean, I guess you could navigate a firebolt to the enemy's position. So, yeah, sure. Okay. What about chef tools? I mean, purify food and drink if it's on their spell list. Okay. What about <clears throat> weaver's tools? What's all oh, the guys that make rugs? Um, sh Maybe. Maybe? Maybe. They well, cast web. Okay. So, this has been the game show. Would you allow an artificer? And overall, the answer is no. <laughs> but honestly, like there's a there's a, you could have a strong theme of casting your spells, and it's also like encouraged to kind of uh, 
describe how your spell isn't like, you know, I'm moving my hands and ooga booga. It's more of like, no, I am, uh, you know, using navigator tools to find the nearest star, which just so happens to be the sun, and I'm casting Guiding Bolt. Yep. Or, you know... I'm using my Smith's tools, and I'm going to take this chisel and smack my hammer with it and cause a uh, thunder wave to, wave to just launch in front of me. Yeah. Or I'm using Potter's tools to... Or no, I'm using glass blower's tools to uh, heat this glass up really hard, and then it turns into a fireball. Fair. Yeah. So the spell casting is very thematic. Uh, it's a it lot of role play potential. Yeah. Especially like in the middle of combat. Oh yeah, definitely. But your spell casting ability is your intelligence. So it's going to be just the same as a wizard on that. So your spell save DC is 8 plus proficiency plus intelligence mod. Attack modifiers proficiency plus the intelligence mod. And you can also uh, cast an artifice or spell as a ritual if it has that tag. Just like every other class. Well, some classes don't get ritual casting. Yeah. But here's where the Artificer comes into its own. Second level infuse item. Oh, boy. You gain the ability to imbue mundane items with certain magical infusions. So you can go into the infusions known. When you gain this feature, pick four four Artificer infusions to learn. Choosing from the Artificer infusion section. Um... You learn additional infusions of your choice when you reach certain levels in the class. So, right uh, here. For that, uh, you get four at second level all the way to fifth level. Once you reach sixth level, it goes up to six infusions known. Uh, tenth level, you get eight. And at fourteenth level, you get ten. And finally, you get twelve infusions known at eighteenth level. But here's the interesting thing. So, there are some prerequisites that come with these infusions. Yeah. So the arcane, I will, we'll just go over a few of them because there are a lot. So something like armor of magical strength. All it requires is a suit of armor, but it does require attunement. Armor has six charges. The worker can expend the armor's charges in the following ways. When you make a strength save or check, you can expend one charge and add a bonus to the roll equal to your intelligence modifier. And if you were to be knocked prone, you can use a reaction to expend one charge to avoid being knocked prone. The armor regains 1d6 expended charges daily at dawn. You can also have an enhanced enhanced arcane focus. The item is a rod, staff, or wand. Requires attunement. While holding this item, a creature gets a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls. In addition, the creature ignores half cover while making a spell attack. And this is one of the things that increases uh, in potency as you level up. It increases to a plus two when you reach 10th level in this class. Radiant weapon. It grants a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with it. While holding it, the wielder can take a bonus action to cause it to shed bright light in a 30-foot radius and dim light for another 30 feet. They can extinguish it as a bonus action. The weapon has four charges. As a reaction immediately after being hit by an attack, the wielder can expend one charge and cause the attacker to be blinded until the end of the attacker's next turn. Unless the attacker succeeds on a con save against the artificer's spell to save DC, the weapon regains 1d4 expended charges daily at dawn. And the next is the one that gets overused in my game, which is repeating shot. So it gets a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls and... It ignores the loading property if it has it. If you load no ammunition into the weapon, it produces its own, automatically creating one piece of magic ammunition when you make a ranged attack with it. The ammunition created by the weapon vanishes the instant after it hits or misses. So you you could have a longbow and just never buy arrows. Yeah. And the fun thing is, the artificer doesn't have to be the person to use these uh, infusions. You can put Radiant Weapon on someone else's sword. Or you can give someone else the Enhanced Arcane Focus. But another thing that you get with Arcane Infusions is you can replicate Magic Item. And they have a good amount of lists here for what you can uh, make. Well, here's, here's an idea. Why don't we just do three from each of the lists? Because okay. right here at second level you can do... A bag of holding, goggles of night, and sending stones. Pretty good. Once you reach 6th level, you can replicate 
uh, Boots of Elven Kind. Very good. Uh, Lantern of Revealing, and the Ring of Water Walking. And That's interesting. There's still more to choose from. Tenth level, you've got Bracers of Archery, Brooch of Shielding. There's a lot on this one. Um, Helm of Telepathy, Hat of Disguise, Ring of Jumping, Winged Boots. I've used Winged Boots before on an Artificer. It's interesting. And then 14th level is where you get the more powerful stuff like Gem of Seeing, Horn of Blasting, Ring of Free Action, Protection, and of the Ram. Oof. Yeah, Ring of the Ram. You can replicate that. It's a good ring. Or an Amulet of Health. You know, your con score is 19 where you were, while you wear this amulet. Yep. It's just one of those things. Yeah, uh, so the Artificer, and there's a lot more that the Artificer can make with their infusions, so we, we recommend you personally check it out. Yeah, because there's there's a lot. But at third level, you get your subclass, and they only have four released form. Uh, the Alchemist, the Armor, the Artillerist, and the Battlesmith, and we'll go over those later. But you also get the feat, Right Tool for the Job. You want to you know what this does? Well, duh. Okay, well, basically, uh, you spend an hour of uninterrupted uninter- work uh, which can be done during a short or long rest. And you make the necessary tools that you want. May as well. Like for an hour. But here's where that comes into... It's artesian tools. Well, here here's the interesting thing about that. Because at 6th level, of course, 4th, 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th, you're gaining ability score improvements. Also, uh, if you use this feature again, the previous tools disappear. Cool. So you, you don't have to buy tools at all. Well, here's where it gets interesting on that. Tool expertise. Starting at 6th level, your proficiency is doubled for any ability check that you make using a proficiency, uh, using your proficiency with a tool. It is not... That's that's ridiculous. Become proficient in smith tools, thief tools. Ooh. That is cool. Double your proficiency bonus is pretty much just a jack-of-all-trades again. In a way. Yeah. Flash of genius at seventh level to where you gain the ability to come up with solutions under pressure. When you are another creature, you can see within 30 feet of you make an ability check or a saving throw. You can use your reaction to add your intelligence modifier to the roll. You can use it a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier. You gain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. It's a good one. And what is uh, one of the two needed... Ability scores for the Artificer? Intelligence. There you go. You're yeah. going to have a high intelligence. Well, yeah. uh, at least a mid, like a plus three. Yeah. So that's an automatic plus three. Yeah, should be. So it's, that's a really good bless. One of the, what was it? It was, we, we did a game of yours. We were like in the middle of a storm on a on a ship. And I had failed on like a on a saving throw or something to make sure that I would still stay on. And then failed after favor of the gods. And then, well, yeah. No, no, I had advantage on it for some reason. And I failed on both advantages. And then Eric, who's playing an artificer, gave me a flash of genius. Then I rolled favored favored by the gods. And through just a series of other buffs, I was able to stay on board. Yeah. Because otherwise you were going to be, you know, lost at sea. Gone. Now, at 10th level, you gain Magic Item Adept, so you achieve a profound understanding of how to use and make magic items. You can attune up to four items at once. And if you craft a magic item with a rarity of common or uncommon, it takes you a quarter of the normal time, and it costs you half as much the usual gold. Nice. Oh, yeah, it's very nice. Now, I'm guessing in this uh, instance, it'd be like gold being a material component similar to casting a spell to where I would rule it. It just kind of consumes it, I would guess. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's going to be a whole lot of time trying well, to find all the right stuff to buy. And well, stuff. it's like it, uh, crafting a magic item is like listed under the downtime activities for yeah. 5e, and there's some other rules in there. But uh, long story short, to like create a magic item during your downtime, uh, it, it takes you have to spend an amount of gold to get that item and also it has to make sense in the story yeah Uh, but at 11th level you get a spell storing item 
this is a good ability right here, Rob. Oh, I can tell. So you learn how to... You've heard of the Ring of Spellstorm before, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good magic item. Uh, basically, this is that, but it doesn't have to be a ring. No, it's a simple or martial weapon or one item you can use as a spellcasting focus. And then you store a spell in it. Yep. Up First, to second level. Up to second level. Uh, also, it takes an action to cast. Also, you don't need to have it prepared. I mean, that's the whole idea between of a spell-storing ring. Yeah. Like the night before, if the wizard has a uh, spell-storing ring and has lightning bolt prepared, stores lightning bolt, or even just pull out the wizard spell book, store it in the ring, keep lightning bolt, Stored fireball, and now you have both a fireball and a lightning bolt that you yeah. can use. So, yeah, this is also another item that you can give to someone else in the party. And also, uh, the spell stays in the object until it's been used a number of times equal to twice your intelligence modifier. Okay, but that's nothing. 14th level, magic item savant. You can attune up to five magic items at once, and you now ignore all class, race, spell, and level requirements on attuning or using a magic item. It's huge. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then at 18th level, you can go up to six magic items for attunement. Oh. But then they're at 20th level. What's the 20th level ability? It is a Soul of Artifice. Okay. It's one of those moments to where you wake up after you've hit 20th level and you just hear a... <laughs> and you're locked and loaded, ready to go. So, you gain a plus one to all saving throws per magic item you are currently attuned to. Up to a plus six. Or, hold, scratch, hold, hold, just pause. Pause. So it affects what saving throws? All. Okay, and proficient it's, or not? And it's a plus one per what now? Per magic item you are currently attuned to. And how many magic items can you attune to as an artificer of the twentieth level? Six. So you're telling me the artificer can potentially have a plus six to all saving throws? No, a plus six to four. And because of proficiency, a plus 12 to the rest. And then that's not even mentioning like the uh, ability it would be a It would be a plus 12 to the saving throw for constitution and intelligence because of proficiency. Man, that's crazy. Bonus. Wait, didn't the monk have something like that? Um, I don't think so. Or they may have, but it may have been in the way like of... Like similar. Yeah. Either that or it was in, in the uh, way of the four elements, and we just completely wiped that one from our memory bank. Yeah, it's very similar. Uh, monks get proficiencies in all saving throws at 14th level. And the proficiency bonus at 20th level is a plus six, so... Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's still crazy. Oh, yeah, it's still absolutely mental. Man. That's ridiculous, isn't there? And there's another thing attached to this feat, this feature. Uh, pretty much. If you're reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can use your action to end one of your artificer infusions, causing you to drop to one hit point instead of zero. And then, when you know what you do overnight, you make a new one. I'm sorry. How many infusions can you have at twentieth level? Twelve. Oh wow. Because here's the thing. Does it say that it needs to be one of the ones that you are attuned to? No. So, make six for yourself and six for the rest of the party, just like Sauron did with the Rings of Power. Yeah. And then... Sauron was an artificer! Yes, he was. So, now at 20th level, you have 12 instances. 12 instances in which... You could sit there at 1 HP, and when you go to go to 0 hit points, you use your reaction to end the repeating shot on the ranger's crossbow and tell them, you got to reload now because I'm staying alive. <laughs> Gosh, that is ridiculous. 
But here we go into getting into the subclasses. Now the subclasses just add up, just add on to that. This like is, they need more. Yeah. So on the alchemist, at third level you gain proficiency with the alchemist supplies. You know, a third or fourth proficient tool. Uh, if also, you, if you already have it, you gain proficiency with another type of artesian tools. Yeah, choice. why not? It I checks mean, out. They need it. Yeah, they do. Uh, you also learn alchemist spells. You always have certain spells prepared after you reach particular levels in this class. So at third level, you would have Healing Word and Ray of Sickness. Okay. Fifth level, Flaming Sphere. Okay. Melf's Acid Arrow. Okay. Ninth level, Gaseous Form and Mass Healing Word. Okay. Thirteenth, Blight and Death Ward. Okay. Seventeenth, <clears throat> Cloud Kill. Okay. And Raise Dead. Why? Because... You made a potion that is like a zombie virus. It's an interesting spell list. But here's here's the other thing. At third level, you get experimental elixir. So whenever you finish a long rest, you can magically produce an experimental elixir in an empty flask that you touch. You roll on the experimental elixir table for its effects. As an action, a creature can drink the elixir or administer it to an incapacitated creature. So, here's the kicker. When you reach certain levels in this class, you can make more elixirs at the end of a long rest. Two at 6th and three at 15th. And you roll for each. If you roll a 1, it's a healing potion. Whereas 2d4 plus your intelligence modifier. If it's 2, swiftness. The drinker's walking speed increases by 10 feet for an hour. 3, resilience. Plus one bonus AC for 10 minutes. Boldness. The drinker can roll a D4 and add the number roll to every attack roll and saving throw they make for the next minute. Nice. Flight. The drinker gains a flying speed of 10 feet for 10 minutes. And transformation. The drinker's body is transformed as if by the alter self spell. The drinker determines the transformation caused by the spell and the effects of which last for 10 minutes. It's all kinds of games. In the words of the Hodge twins, all kinds of games. Not bad. Not bad. What do you get at fifth level, though? That's the alchemical savant. So you've developed masterful, masterful command of magical chemicals, enhancing the healing and damage you create through them. When you cast a spell using your alchemist supplies as the spellcasting focus, you gain a bonus to one roll of the spell. The roll must restore hit points or be a damage roll that deals acid, fire, necrotic, or poison damage, and the bonus equals your intelligence modifier. So in other words, you cast Fireball, and you add in your intelligence modifier. You cast Healing Word, and you add in your intelligence modifier. Or even Firebolt. Yep. Acid Splash. Or Melf's Acid Arrow. Mm-hmm. That's ridiculous. Now, on ninth level, you get restorative regents. You can incorporate restorative regents into some of your works. So, when a creature drinks an experimental elixir you created, the creature gains temp health equal to 2d6 plus your intelligence modifier, no matter what it is. So, they could gain, they could heal, what was it, 2d4? Yeah, they could heal 2d4 plus intelligence and get 2d6 temp health plus intelligence. And you can cast less duration, Lesser Restoration without expending a spell slot and without preparing the spell, provided you use the Alchemist Supplies and the spell, as the spell casting focus. And you can do that a number of times equal to your Intelligence Modifier. And you can do it again after a long rest. You know, Lesser Restoration is not a good spell at all. It's a second level, one action casting time, instantaneous duration, abjuration school, range of touch, attacks I save, but there's no components as verbal... Somatic and material in the case of the artificer, but you touch a creature and can end either one disease or one condition afflicting it. The condition can be blinded, deafened, paralyzed, or poisoned. Yep. Now, at 15th level, you gain chemical mastery. You've been exposed to so many chemicals that they pose little risk to you, and you can use them quickly to quickly end certain ailments. You gain resistance to acid and poison damage, and you are immune to the poison condition. Nice. You can cast Greater Restoration and Heal 
without expending a spell slot, without preparing the spell, and without having material components, provided that you use the alchemist supplies as the spellcasting focus. Once you do that, you can't do it again until you finish a long rest. But would you like to know what Hill does? Well, let me tell you what Greater Restoration does, because it did Lester Restoration. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you can reduce the target's exhaustion level by one, or uh, you can end one effect that charmed or petrified the target, uh, one curse including the target's attunement cur to a cursed magic item, uh, any reduction to one of the target's ability scores, and one effect reducing the target's hit point maximum. Nice. Now, heal. <clears throat> it's a six-level spell. They don't even have access to six-level spells. Nice. You know what it does. What does it do? Choose a creature you can see within range, which is 60 feet. A surge of positive energy washes over the creature, causing it to regain 70 hit points. Say that again. 70 hit points. Oh, no. This spell also ends blindness, deafness, and any disease affecting the target. Well, that's nice. What do you mean that's nice? It's nice. That's scary. Because now you have the Artificer with 12 infusions at 20th level that can cast heal on somebody else and then stay at 1 HP for a potential 12 rounds. Well, yeah. If he doesn't get attacked more than once. Yeah, but like, you know, you could still go around the 20th level, uh, whatever, Soul of the Artifice or whatever. Yeah. With that Artifusion. Art of in art of I'm having a stroke. Infusions. Throw me one of those experimental elixirs. I'm having a stroke over here. Oh boy. <laughs> well, all you got to do is you just have to deal enough damage to outright kill them. Oh no. Yeah. Because okay. when you go to zero or below, you use no no if, the infusion. It says if it's if it's not enough to outright kill you, it doesn't work. Oh okay. Yeah. So just, if you're having a problem with your Artificer, this is advice from Dungeon Master to Dungeon Master. Kill him. Yep. <laughs> now the Armorer. This is the one that Eric's playing in my game. So your spells are 3rd level Magic Missile and Thunder Wave, 5th level Mirror Image and Shatter, ninth level Hypnotic Pattern and Lightning Bolt, 13th level Fire Shield and Greater Invisibility, 17th level, Pass Wall and Wall of Force. Also, they get the proficiency with Smith's tools. Yes. Or an additional tool choice. So, here's the interesting part. You get Arcane Armor. Okay. So, you gain the following benefits while wearing the armor. Because as an action, you can turn a suit of armor that you're wearing into Arcane Armor. Provided as long as you have the Smith's tools in hand. If the armor normally has a strength requirement, the Arcane Armor lacks this requirement for you. You can use the arcane armor as a spellcasting focus for your artificer spells. Oh. The armor attaches to you and can't be removed against your will. It also expands to cover your entire body, although you can retract or deploy the helmet as a bonus action. The armor replaces any missing limbs, function, functioning identically to a limb it replaces. Nice. You can doff or don the armor as an action. The armor continues to be arcane armor until you don another suit of armor or you die. Which means the way that I ruled it in my game is the armor attaches to you and can't be removed against your will. If you are incapacitated or unconscious, it can be removed if you're unconscious. That's how I ruled it. That You don't have to rule it like that if you don't want to. Now the armor model. This is is where it gets stupid okay so you have two different kind of uh themes that you can choose from two different armor models yeah guardian you design your armor to be in the front line of conflict and you gain the following features thunder gauntlets each of the armor's gauntlets counts as a simple melee weapon while you aren't holding anything in it and deals 1d8 thunder damage on a hit a creature hit by the gauntlet has disadvantage on all attack rolls against targets other than you until the start of your next turn as the armor magically emits a distracting pulse when the creature attacks someone else. In defensive field, 
as a bonus action, you can gain temporary hit points equal to your level in this class, replacing temporary hit points you already have. You lose these temporary hit points if you doff the armor. You can use the bonus action turn a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So in other words, you can use a bonus action to give yourself three temp health at third level, up to twice. At 20th level, 20 HP, six times. Now, the Infiltrator armor, this is the one that I like personally. This is the uh, subtle undertakings. So, a lightning launcher, a gem-like node appears on one of your armored fists or on the chest. And it counts as a simple ranged weapon. With a normal range of 90 feet and a long range of 300 feet, and it deals 1d6 lightning damage on a hit. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with it, you can deal an extra 1d6 lightning damage to the target. Your all you uh your walking speed also increases by five feet, and you have advantage on stealth checks. Huh. If the armor normally imposes disadvantage on such checks, the advantage and disadvantage cancel each other out as normal. So you could wear full plate armor as an artificer. Turn it into the infiltrator armor. And because it does not require strength anymore, you don't lose this movement speed. And the stealth check disadvantage goes away. Yeah. Oh, and at fifth level, you can attack twice. Nice. I mean, it's there. Now, at ninth level, you gain armor modifications. So you can use, you learn how to use your artificer infusions to specially modify an arcane armor. That armor now counts as separate items for the purposes of your infused items feature. So the chest get... piece, the boots, the helmet, and the armor special weapon. So, fun fact. Uh, we didn't really cover this, but with the infusions, you cannot infuse two properties onto one item. No. but One, one each. With armor modifications, you can infuse... Total of one, two, three, four infusions yes. onto your armor. And you never have to take the armor off because you can just say it has a built in bathroom. <laughs> the this, infiltrator armor just shocks the doo doo away. It has a poop shoot. <laughs> Man, that is. So here's the deal about that though each of those items can bear one of your infusions, and the infusions transfer over if you change your armor's model with the armor model feature. Really? In addition, the maximum number of items that you can infuse to at once increases by two. But those extra items must be part of your arcane armor. So, you're so you me. can have a total of 14 infused items. At 20th level. That's and you want to go over the perfected armor? That's Yeah, that's fine. I mean, are you understanding now why I was like, hey, dude, we got to do something because you getting this all, all this stuff for free is going to be a bit of an issue. I want to play an artificer now. <laughs> why you th yeah. I, I, let me I now see that. why. I want to play an artificer again. <laughs> uh, let me, ref let, you know, now we see why Eric plays an artificer every game. Because it's good. Yeah. Even though I still swear by the time we hit 20th level, my rogue ranger or my rogue blood hunter will outperform him. <laughs> At 15th level, your armor, you gain perfected armor. You've gotten that good. So, your guardian armor, when a huge or small creature you can see ends its turret within 30 feet of you, you can use your reaction to magically force it to make a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, you pull the creature up to 25 feet directly to an unoccupied space. If you pull the target to a space within five feet of you, you can make a melee weapon attack as part of this reaction. You can use the reaction a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Homeboy turns into sub zero, uh, scorpion. Sorry, homeboy turns into scorpion. He says, "Get over here." That's a that's a good ability. 
Oh, what about the infiltrator? What's what's it do? Any, Any creature, creature that takes lightning damage from your lightning launcher glimmers with magical light until the start of your next turn. The glimmering creature sheds a dim light in a five foot radius and has disadvantage on attack rolls against you, as the light jolts it if it attacks you. In addition, the next roll has against it has advantage, and if that attack hits, the target takes an extra one d six lightning damage. So you are telling me right now it's got a built in fairy fire or guiding bolt, technically. So you are telling me right now that as an infiltrated armor, perfected at this point. Yeah. I can attack him twice with the lightning launcher because I have extra attack at this point. Yep. So that's 2d6 lightning damage. Yep. Plus, once on each of your turns when you hit a creature with it, you can deal an extra 1d6 lightning damage to that target. Yep. Oh, I forgot to mention, you add your intelligence modifier to each of those 1D, the first two 1d6s. Yep. And then you can, you know, you've already hit them once. Extra attack has advantage. And it's another 1d6 lightning damage. So that is 4d6 plus, at this point, 10 yep. lightning damage. And then you know what it does because it automatically does lightning damage? What? Gives the next guy to hit him advantage. And there's another d6 lightning. Interesting. That's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's... You want to go over to the Artillerist, because the Artillerist is the one that kind of sticks out to me. Oh, this is one I played. I got this one. Go ahead. I just want to do some uh, quick math real quick. Oh, okay, so you're averaging uh, about... So 50% of the time, you're dealing 22 to 26 points of damage to them in that math. Yeah, that's, that's not too much. That's not too much, no. but not when, the, not when the fighter's out here doing an average of like... 40 some odd with a long sword. No, but you got to think it's a uh, lightning damage with the advantage. Oh yeah. So it keeps it up. So it's allowing that fighter to hit more accurately or that rogue to use their sneak attack. Yep. Specifically the assassin rogue that does a whole lot of damage. So the artillerist is exactly what it is. This is the artillery boy. Third level, you get proficiency in wood carver tools. You want to know why? Uh, sure. So you can engrave the stock of your gun. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, if you already have wood carver tool proficiencies, you gain another one. Anyway, here are your spells you get. At third level, you get shield and thunder wave. Makes sense. Fifth level, you get scorching ray. <sighs> Love it. And shatter. Ninth level, you get fireball and wind wall. Uh, 13th, you get Ice Storm and Wall of Fire. And 17th, you get Cone of Cold and Wall of Fire. Cone of Cold is overlooked until you see the Oni pull it out on your party and you're like, oh, I forgot about Cone of Cold. Yeah. I mean, it's... 8d8 points of cold damage. Yeah. And uh, if they're killed, they become a frozen statue until it thaws. Yeah. Interesting. Also, it's a 60-foot cone. And it's a con save. Yeah. But anyways, uh, you get a feature called Eldritch Cannon. And I love these things. So basically what this is, uh, you use your wood carvers or smith tools to uh, create a small or tiny Eldritch Cannon in an unoccupied space on a horizontal service, surface within five feet of you. You don't want to know, when you do this, you have to uh, spend expend a spell slot to create one. And you can only have one cannon up at a time. So, it is a magical object, it has an AC of 18, and a number of hit points equal to 5 times your artificer level. So at this point, it's only 15 hit points. It is immune to poison and psychic damage, and if it's forced to make an ability check or saving throw, it treats all its ability scores as a 10, so it's a plus 0. If the mending spell casts on it, it regains 2d6 hit points, it disappears if it's reduced to 0 hit points, or after 1 hour, you can dismiss it early as an action. So, let me tell you what your options are. You can have a flamethrower, a force ballista, or a protector. Hey, my ballista! Yeah. <laughs> the Befishta. Yeah, Befishta. Bring out the force Befishta. The what? The <laughs> <laughs> flying fish. So, with a flamethrower? It doesn't sound scary until you launch a sailfish, or a swordfish, or a sawfish, or a great white. I was about to say. A blue whale. <laughs> Load in a great white. 
Dude, no, is- dude, loading a sperm, uh, loading a sperm well. Load in, uh, and just crush the entire village. Load in Moby Dick. <laughs> Anyways, so here's what the things are: a flamethrower. It's a 15 foot cone. Uh, each creature in that area must make a deck saving throw against your spell save DC, or take 2d8 fire damage, or half as much on a failed save. It also ignites any flammable objects in the area that aren't being warned or carried. Oh, force ballista. It is a, a cannon with a range of 120 feet. On a hit, they take 2d8 force damage, and if the target is a creature, it is pushed 5 feet away from the cannon. Nice. Yeah. Protector. This cannon emits a burst of positive energy that grants itself and each creature of your choice within 10 feet of it a number of temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus your intelligence modifier. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Also, it's a bonus action to activate any of these. Oh, Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's rough. Yeah, that's good. So, fifth level, you get Arcane Firearm. Uh, Basically, you turn a wand, staff, or rod into a gun. This is a conduit for your destructive spells. When you finish a long rest, you can use your woodcarver tools to carve special sigils into a wand, staff, or rod and thereby turn it into your arcane firearm. The sigils disappear from the object if you later carve it into a different item. Otherwise, the sigil lasts forever, even if you die. Wow. So you can use your arcane firearm as a spellcasting focus for your artificer spells. When you cast an artificer spell through it, roll a d8, and you gain a bonus to one of the spell's damage rolls equal to the number rolled. Oof. Yeah. That's rough. Because mm-hmm. what did you gain? Lightning bolt. Cone yeah. of gold. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you gained fireball. You didn't get lightning bolt. Oh. oh. I was thinking of the uh, armor. Yeah. But guess what? It works with cantrips, too. Oh, yeah. Because if you've got something like firebolt, it's a D10 and a D8. Yeah. You also get explosive cannon, which at ninth level. The cannon's damage rolls are all increased by 1d8. So now that flamethrower is doing 3d8. That force bliss is doing 3d8. And that's it. Yep. But as an action, you can command the cannon to detonate if you are within 60 feet of it. Doing so destroys the cannon and forces each creature within 20 feet of it to make a dexterity saving throw against your spell DC. Taking 3d8 force damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. I'd like to see a little bit more damage on that. Yeah. Honestly. Honestly. Because, like, the thing is... 5d8 would be better because this is ninth level. You're going to fight some... You're going to be fighting some serious things by then, and I don't think... I think 5d8 would be better. And honestly, you know, that's the same amount of damage that they're doing now with their regular attack. Because, I mean, if you look at it, <laughs> Ice Storm um, does 2d8 bludgeoning damage and 4d6 cold on a failed save. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind it doing sixty-eight. Well, even right here, when the wall appears, each creature with on wall of fire, on a failed save, a creature takes five d eight fire damage, and oh, that's thirteenth level. Sorry, uh, ninth level, you're getting fireball and wind wall. That's. I mean, I'm sorry if you if you at ninth level gain fireball, give him five d eight. Yeah, you know, it's just you know it it would it would make it a little bit better because I mean. By this point, it was what? Three times your level or five times your level for the health? For the... It was five times. Okay, so it's 45 health. Yeah. It's really not that much because at ninth level, even if you roll average of um, 45, that's going to be nine more levels worth of constitution modifiers of, say, plus three, maybe. So that's going to be another... Nine and three is 27, plus 45 is 72. So you got seventy two health. You're gonna be halfway decent, okay. Your cannon, maybe not. So if you're gonna to have to sacrifice it, yeah, let I'd, it go I'd, out with a real bang. Yeah, honestly, the three d eight is just a little. Because I'd rather, I'd rather run the possibility of only doing five damage by rolling a one on all the dice than roll doing three damage by rolling yeah. one on all the dice. But here's the thing: at fifteenth level, you get fortified position. You and your allies have half cover while within 10 feet of a cannon you create with the Eldritch Cannon. Hold up. 
What? You and your allies have half cover. While you're within 10 feet of a cannon, you create with the Eldritch Cannon feature. So you just give everybody a plus two to the bonus to their AC. And dexterity saving throws. Oh. Yeah. Also, you can now have two cannons up at the same time. What? You can create two cannons with the same action, but it doesn't have to be the same, spe- but not the same spell slot. And you can now activate both of them with the same bonus action. And they okay. can be identical or they can be different. Okay. That's dumb. That's dumb because at this point they've got 75 health. Yep. Each. Yep. And if you're not at range, why would you do a force ballista instead of just doing the... Let me go back up here and read it real quick. The flamethrower to give you two 15-foot cones that do 3d8 fire damage. Each. Yeah. It's good, ain't it? It's, it's stupid. It's, it's doom. Like this man went to engineering school and passed with flying colors. <laughs> uh, he became the headmaster. Oof. I bet he's a butthole. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, keep in mind, your allies get half cover while they're within these cannons, within 10 feet of these cannons. Oh, yeah. So you're looking at... You're looking at a 40-foot line of half cover right there. Oh, my God. That's broken. It's broken. Yeah. The thing is, though, those cannons don't have half cover. I mean, it is what it is. But, I mean, it's still 75 health to deal with. And what was their AC, what was their AC again? 18. Yeah, I mean, they've got an AC of 18. It's pretty rough. I mean, 15th level, it really shouldn't be an, an issue. <laughs> nah. But it's still an 18. Let's see how bad the Battlesmith is. So, um, you gain tool proficiencies with Smith tools. And if you already have the proficiency, you can gain proficiency in another type of artisan tools. Uh, the spells, third level, Heroism and Shield. <clears throat> Fifth level, Branding Smite. And Warding Bond. Ooh. Ninth, Aura of Vitality and Conjure Barrage. Okay. Thirteenth, Aura of Purity and Fire Shield. Seventeenth, Banishing Smite and Mass Cure Wounds. Huh. The Battlesmith is a paladin. Yeah. Except he has the shield spell. Yeah. And Conjure Barrage, which I want to say was a ranger spell. I think it's in ranger. Yeah. So... At third level, your combat training and your experiments with magic have paid off in two ways, giving you battle ready. You gain proficiency with martial weapons, and when you attack, when you attack with a magic weapon, you use your intelligence modifier instead of strength or dexterity modifier for the attack and damage rolls. In other words, it's kind of similar to the Blade Singer, yeah, in that regard. But here is, yeah. The Still Defender. The what? The Still Defender. Oh, the Still Defender. Your tinkering has borne you a faithful companion, a Still Defender. It is friendly to you and your companions, and it obeys your commands. This creature's game statistics in the Still Defender stat block, which uses your proficiency bonus in several places. We'll go over that in a minute. Now... It can move and use its reaction on its own, but it don't. The only action it takes on your on its turn is the dodge action, unless you take a bonus action on your turn to command it to take another. If the mending spell is cast on it, it regains two d six hit points. If it has died within the last hour, you can use your smith pool, tools as an action to revive it, provided you're within five feet of it and you expend a spell slot of first level or higher. The still defender returns to life after one minute. <clears throat> with all its hit points restored. Nice. At the end of a long rest, you can create a new Still Defender if you have your Smith tools with you. If you already have a Still Defender from this feature, the first one immediately perishes. The Defender also perishes if you die. So, real quick, it's a medium construct, 15 AC. The hit points are 2 plus your intelligence modifier plus 5 times your artifice level with a speed of 40 feet. 
immune to poison, immune to charmed, exhausted, and poisoned, has dark vision for 60 feet and a passive perception of 10 plus proficiency times 2. I'm sorry, what? The passive perception is 10 plus PB. I'm going I'm going to guess that that's proficiency bonus. Yep. Yeah, 10 plus proficiency bonus doubled. So when you summon this guy or make this guy at third level, it has a passive perception of 14. Okay. When you do it at 20th level, it's got a passive perception of 22. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not overly powerful. No. But it's vigilant, and it can't be surprised. So, there goes sneak attack. Unless it's just pure advantage. You know, it can't be, like, off of a hide action. Yeah. So, force-empowered rend. Your spell attack modifier to hit, which is 1d8 plus your uh, proficiency bonus. And repair. The magical mechanisms inside the defender restore 2d8 plus proficiency bonus hit points to itself or to one other construct or object within five feet. And it can do that three times per day. Huh, how about that? Oh, and it also has deflect attack to where the defender imposes disadvantage on the attack roll of one creature it can see within five feet of it. Provided the attack roll is against the creature other than the defender. Oh. Oh, and uh, fifth level, you can attack twice rather than once. Oh, you get that at fifth level for your for yourself and not the still defender? That is for yourself. Okay. Unfortunately. I mean, it's still good. I mean, yeah, it's all right, but... So what's Arcane Jolt do at ninth level? <laughs> You've learned new ways to channel Arcane Energy to harm or heal. When either you tar- hit a target with a magic weapon attack or your still defender hits a target, you can channel magical energy through the strike to create one of the following effects. The target takes an extra 2d6 force damage. Nice. Or choose one creature or object you can see one- within 30 feet. Healing energy flows into the chosen recipient, restoring 2d6 hit points to it. You can use this energy a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier, but you cannot but you can do so no more than once per turn and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. But do not forget that there are magic items that could, especially if homebrewed, if the DM has made them themselves and or okayed them, that can take your intelligence above a 20. Yeah. So it could be a plus 5 or it could be a plus 6 or a plus 7. It could be anything. But now... At 15th level, you gain improved defender, and your arcane jolt and still defender become more powerful. The extra damage and healing of your arcane jolt both increase to 4d6. 4d6 force or 4d6 healing. Your still defender gains a plus 2 bonus to armor class, so it'll be an AC of 17. Not bad. Whenever your still defender uses its deflect attack, the attacker takes force damage equal to 1d4 plus intelligence modifier. Not bad. No, it's not bad at all. It's not as powerful as the artillerist or the armorer. Absolutely not. It's not quite as cool as the alchemist. I would say it's cooler than the alchemist. I don't know. I don't know. It's the the randomness of the... It's the randomness of the elixirs. Because you don't know what you're going to get. That's that's what you... I like the battlesmith because it's you get a buddy. Yeah, but you got that with the artillerist too. I mean, it's not technically, you know, they're they're no, constructs, but you can build you can build this guy to look like an actual person, right? So, I mean, you still can't really carry on current conversations with it, but I mean, it's it's another thing on the battlefield. To the biggest thing that this had, the biggest uh, advantage this has over the cannons is the forty feet of movement. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. You know because what I want to do in, now? in every other way, except for, let's see, on the Battlesmith, um, two plus intelligence modifier, so we'll just say it's five. So that's seven plus five times your level. So it's going to have 107 health, while the cannons are going to have 100 health, but you can have two. The Still Defender is not quite as good as the cannons. But it can actually move around and take its own actions. Yeah. And do do actual stuff. Like you could tell it to pick something up. If a if 
if one of your companions go down, you can say, go pick them up and bring them back. Move 20 feet, use this action to pick them up, and come back 20 feet. Take the opportunity attack. No problem. Yeah. So it's more useful, but it's not as powerful. You know what I want to do now? What? I want to create a big bad evil guy that's just an artificer with uh, features from all of the subclasses. Oh, you could make one heck of a bad guy to just mix and match different things. Oh, yeah. Because what you could do is um, you could take the the uh, the still defender and the improved defender to where it gets the plus two to armor to ace, uh, plus two to armor class. The extra damage and healing is now up to forty six. And when it uses defect attack, uses uh, does one d four plus your intelligence modifier. But you come back down into artillerist and at. And combine it with, you can now have two still defenders at the same time. Oh, yeah. And you can activate both of them with the same bonus action. And you just mix and match and all that stuff, because I'll go ahead and tell you. The one that you'd probably want to throw in from the alchemy would probably be... Um, just the the third level additive of being able to make the elixirs, yeah. But kind of change them around some to where you can maybe like do a a two d four fire, like alchemist fire or something like that for a bad guy. Here here's my idea for the, like a big bad evil guy, and heck, I may extend my campaign just to have this guy out. <laughs> it's an artificer, like a super out artificer. It's the artillerist, right? And he's got the armor, right? But his still defender has both the arcane firearm and the eldritch cannons on him, and the still defender can activate those. Oh boy! Oh boy, that's rough. Yeah, and heck, why not? You put the guardian armor on the still defender. Oh my god! And you get the infantry armor for the the main guy. Yeah, I think Ford and Octavius are just gonna ride off into the sunset. <laughs> But I know we we were planning on hopefully having all the classes covered by the end of the year, but we're one short because we did an extra one D and D episode. Yeah. So next week we're going over Blood Hunter, and I will say now because I got to thinking about it while I was at work, the Blood Hunter is just a little bit of a cooler version of a Ranger. Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah, it's a little cooler. Doesn't mean that it's better, I'll say but it is a little cooler. I'll say it's edgier. Yeah, it's kind of like a it's a it's a combination really of the fighter, the uh, ranger, and the warlock, uh, but only if you go profane soul. Yeah. But uh, speaking of artificers, uh, let's give a shout out to one of the characters and one of the players who made this character in your game, Eric. We've mentioned he's been on the show before. We've mentioned his artificer many times as in your game. And it's actually going to be a character coming up in the Dreadful Six, a D and D story. Yep, Marcel Slavon. Yeah, and he is a. He's one of the backbones of the story. Oh uh, yeah, I'll put it that way. Uh, if you want to find out more, I guess we just have to listen to it. Uh, but yes, we are getting ready in a couple of weeks to start recording the first episode. And then I'm going to sink probably 30 hours of editing into that episode. And February 25th. Search on Spotify for The Dreadful Six, a D&D story, and it'll be there. All right. I'm, I'm excited for it. You and me both. I like guess it's, it's really getting to me, but, you know, just hope it turns out good. Hopefully. Because there's, there's two ways it can go. It can be awesome, or it can be garbage. <laughs> we'll just see. If it's garbage, we'll keep making it. Yeah, I mean, we keep making this, and it's garbage. Yeah, so. we haven't, we've improved one time, and that's when we got better mics. Yep. And that is... We got better mics and had worse conversations. Yeah. Yep. They cancel each other out, you know? Fair enough. Yeah. We've had a lot of episodes where it's like, uh, uh, there's been low energy because I'm always tired. Yep. One of these is those episodes. But... We've also had some good episodes. Oh, the... 
the expert classes D and D. That's possibly the best episode we've ever done. That I've was never laughed that, that hard. That was so funny. There were many times where I rewinded while editing just so I could listen to it again. A Skyrim crouch. You're telling me that the artificer can now just do a Skyrim crouch, and the evil wizard who's scrying on him is like, "Where did he go?" <laughs> but tune in next week for the Blood Hunter. And like I said, February 25th, we will introduce you to the Dreadful Six, which start off as poor, but we'll get there eventually. We we can't really count. Anyways, keep on rolling high. We'll see y'all next week. It's D&D.